Hello, I'm Dustin Wunderlich, Communications Director for the University of Washington College of Education. And I'm here today with College of Education faculty members, Megan Kelly Peterson, Sarah Lopez, and Miriam Packard, and instructional designer, Britta Olson. So we are here today to have some conversation about uh, asynchronous learning. And uh, wanted to start off uh, with uh, Megan. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, some advantages that asynchronous learning can have for students? Absolutely. Um, I think that one, I want to kind of highlight and start off by saying that there's so many resources and a lot of research in the area of online learning and especially around asynchronous learning environments as I think that this has been very well studied and considered over the past number of years. And we are in a current moment in our history that feels especially trying and overwhelming. And at least for me as a instructor and director of a teacher education program inside of the College of Ed, our shift and our move to thinking much more about asynchronous learning is because of the current context of the COVID pandemic. That, that there's something about the flexibility that I think is embedded with inside of asynchronous learning experiences for students that just feels so important to be attending to right now but it's making us recognize that flexibility is actually something that's really powerful and productive when we return to more normal times when and if that happens, right? About, about giving opportunities for learners to engage in content um, on a timeline that makes sense for them with um, opportunities to still really interact in powerful and productive ways with one another, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do it where we're all talking together at the same time, that it might be an opportunity for some learners who really require and need more time to reflect on their thoughts, to kind of put their ideas together in some way that feels, that gives them the, the confidence and the kind of safety and trust to be able to put their ideas out there publicly. So when we create opportunities for Asynchronous learning, I think it's, it just is much more flexible about how and when students can finish the work. Um, within timelines, of course, because we all work within a system when due dates and things like that need to happen. But also, the, the, uh, from my perspective, the opportunity for students to have more think time and more, more um, space to be able to really think about how they want to how and what they want to share and to not be feeling so much like being put on the spot. Right. I, I'm really mm -hmm. curious though, to hear about what my colleagues here are thinking about as they've thought about this work a whole lot more than I have. Yeah. Miriam, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with Megan so much. And I think, you know, in, in our conversations and our work, we're thinking about um, asynchronous and synchronous is not either or, but really not a versus it's not a synchronous versus asynchronous. It's, what affordances does asynchron do asynchronous opportunities offer? And what affordances do synchronous opportunities offer sometimes? And what limitations are in both of those modalities? And how can we really leverage the affordances and the opportunities that Megan just mentioned in really strategic ways, not, now, not just now, but as she mentioned, kind of moving forward. Um, and I like to think about that when I work with faculty and thinking about and myself in teaching, what is our purpose for any given lesson, any given objective, any given discussion? Um, what is our purpose and how can we leverage the affordances in each of these modalities well? And, if, and we can't you know, ignore that asynchronous offers a lot of ways to meet some of our purposes. Sarah and Britta, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts to add? I could uh, jump in. I, I think that it's interesting to think of it in terms of some of the types of classes that we've been um, conducting previously. So some of us had uh, small groups. And again, what you can do in those classes is very different than what you might be able to do in a class with 70 or 100 students. And so there's, uh, there is that element, I think, that we all had to kind of go back and really figure out what, what was the key learning, as, as we just said, what is so important that we know we need to get it across, and then how can we be most effective with that group in this new delivery. And I think that 
was hopefully helpful in just getting us to rethink the what was the, what were the priorities and and how do we make make sure that that learning occurs. Yeah, I love Sarah's point about um, just kind of prioritizing certain learning experiences um, based on the the desired outcome um, and, and Miriam's point about leveraging modalities. I love everything that folks have said so far um, and would just add that kind of one of the elements in this decision making process for kind of selecting the modality that makes the most sense um, was thinking about, you know, in the context of the pandemic, um, certain uh, low bandwidth solutions and, and how sometimes being able to watch a video and be able to respond asynchronously um, is going to be a lot more forgiving, um, technically speaking, um, on, a, on a phone or a tablet if there are students um, and learners kind of with uh, technical limitations. And so there is this kind of strand going through um, that's an equity consideration as well. And I know a lot of people have been thinking about it that and, and framing it that way so that we're making it accessible to, to everyone. So, Bernie, staying with you for a second here, what are uh, maybe some keys to making asynchronous learning spaces work well? Sure. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'm certainly approaching it from a very instructional design kind of focus, and I'm eager to hear from, from our faculty members on the call as well. But um, one of the main things that I immediately think about is approaching the course design side with consistency as a primary principle and that consistency applies to having a really clearly structured course website in Canvas or whatever LMS um, is being used just so that there's kind of consistent navigation patterns. Students always know how to find a certain kind of resource lesson to lesson um, and so having kind of uh, module structure is a really great way to reinforce that. But also just thinking through um, how a student is going to interact with the content and with one another and with the expectations sort of for the given amount of time that a lesson might entail. Um, and making sure that you're approaching it with, with consistency. And then kind of on that same um, thread, you know, thinking about weekly workflows and due dates being consistent. And that's a, a big piece of helping students be successful is kind of helping them with time management and um, the many due dates that they might have across different courses by having sort of a consistent structure in that way. Um, and then kind of more on the facilitation side, you know, what you're doing as the course is continuing. Um, I, I think that, you know, an emphasis on and meaning making as the instructor, as the as the teacher, and being um, really conscious about helping students make connections uh, between what has been learned so far, what is maybe on the radar concept wise. Um, and a, a writer who I like has said, um, you know, looking forward and gesturing back in the way that you frame things for your students. Um, and sometimes that's that can get lost in an asynchronous environment. And so that's a, a really good focus, I think, for, for folks doing this. I wanted to add uh, to echo, I think, the idea of the consistent structure, which Britta mentioned is absolutely key. The other thing that I found was the need to be consistent, but also to break it down into smaller chunks. So for example, I have an undergraduate class that's five credits. And so I realized how that could just look imposing in terms of this list of things that were reasonable, but when you listed them out, it seemed like quite a bit. And so one of the things that I actually did was created sort of subgroups for the week and suggested to the students that, that they might think about tackling one of those at a time as a way for them to break up the work. And so it's, it's both being consistent, but helping them not be overwhelmed, especially when we're providing it asynchronously and delivering everything in, you know, possibly one, you know, uh, kind of one stage. I think that's so important. I, I wanted to say that sometimes people um, think that asynchronous means self-paced and completely self-paced. And you know these are terms that that we get that get thrown around and sometimes have different meanings to different people. And you know creating that structure that helps 
you know, maybe like an undergraduate student um, or, you know, a student who might feel overwhelmed with the volume of how do I manage my time and <laughs> pace myself here. We really can create that for students. Um, and there are, you know, reminder tools. There are little tips and, and tricks along the way to help facilitate that um, that I think uh, I have had a lot of success with. And Megan, any uh, additional thoughts on that? Well, I, um, I have lots of ideas, but I'm wondering if actually some of the ideas I'm thinking about build into even kind of our next kind of little topic and conversation. So I don't know if you want to go ahead and ask that next question. Yeah, well, Austin, maybe, yeah, I let's, that, let's. I think it kind of builds actually on some of these ideas. Yeah, well, let's, let's jump in there. Um, so, so Megan, how does uh, that change uh, from uh, younger students, uh, say at the elementary level, uh, through to older students, um, say in, in uh, college? Um, you know, how, how, how does that approach to asynchronous learning uh, change? Yeah, again, still rather novice myself in making sense of all of these ideas, right? So I direct one of our teacher education programs in the college and all of our teacher candidates inside of the UACT program are all teachers of record. So in this current moment, they were spending all day every day with their third graders or their you know, high school students in math or biology and now all of a sudden have been pushed to think about this work of remote learning, right? And supporting kids age from you know preschool all the way up through high school and how to engage in this. So we've spent a lot of time very quickly trying to call through resources, again, that have been developed before. It's not like asynchronous learning is new to the elementary aged or even to high school aged kind of spaces, but it's not something that we had been thinking a lot about. And I think that for us inside of the UACT program, a key tenet of our work as teachers is building relationships with kids and with our learners. And figuring out how do you do that is, and you can do that really successfully in some really powerful and beautiful ways um, inside of an asynchronous learning space. And, um, and so I think it makes things a little bit different depending on if I'm spending time with kindergartners and what kind of access do they have and how do I set things up? So this, this, this piece that, that my colleagues have brought up around structure and consistency in the structure, I think that that is a consistent theme no matter who the learners are in an asynchronous space and even potentially more important when we're talking about younger aged students because um, there's something about the, them being able to, to access the material really quickly and efficiently and um, again bringing up what Britta I think highlighted is the, the ideas around equity around this is that um, a consistent structure is going to help a family who's working from home, trying to navigate this space while also supporting young kiddos to be able to, so if there's so many different resources or platforms I'm supposed to use and every day it's a little bit different, right? Like that is going to overwhelm a, a, a child, a learner, and also their family in a way that just doesn't feel in any way productive or helpful, especially in the current moment. Um, so I think that the consistency of structure feels especially important, finding resources and, and tools that also allow for developmentally appropriate ways of kids to interact and engage with one another, right? Um, and, and I think that the lift that we're asking families is something especially important to be wondering about, right? So I might be able to find something that the, that the asking um, a college-aged graduate student to make a video about a reflection that they've had to be able to post that, like, that doesn't feel as overwhelming to them versus a second grader who, while they might be able to know how to make the video, do they know how to then upload it and do they know where to upload it and do they, have they thought about, you know, kind of the background that they want to have or things like that. So, so, so when we're asking some of these things that, that um, we might not think are incredibly difficult when you, when you, you've got to really, the way that we're noticing it, especially as we engage with our teachers is to wonder about, well, what, what's the lift of that on a, not just that 
young learner, but on the family, <laughs> because they need to be able to support that in a way, right? And, um, but I think that the idea is around a consistent structure, around tools and resources that feel accessible, that the bandwidth kind of point that I think Britta made um, feels especially important when you've got multiple people in a house who are all working online at the same time. Um, and, and, and the kind of flexibility then that asynchronous provides is something that I think translates quite well to younger age students. And I was just talking with one of our teacher candidates um, the other day who was asking me about the way I had set up modules inside of our Canvas website and was like, I'm going to do that in my own class because I think that actually the, the consistency of the way that it kind of always is structured for him, he was like, this just feels right to be doing with my students too. I said, well, I, I agree. I think that that's really interesting <laughs> to be wondering about. So I mean, that these are some of the ideas that we're playing with and wondering about. Um, but I do think that this lift of what's accessible for students and families, and also how do you still build relationships inside of an asynchronous space, no matter the age of your learner, feels like important considerations to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Britta, are there any um, thoughts, uh, any additional uh, uh, differences uh, to uh, asynchronous learning between uh, younger learners and, and older learners um, that, that you would highlight? Well, I just think, you know, there's, there's a fairly diff, there are a lot of commonalities, but there's a fairly different kind of ed tech space between the, the age groups. Um, and mostly I'm thinking about the kind of wealth of like online practice tools that are more geared for pre-k to, to 12th graders um, and there are lots out there and there are lots right now that are doing sort of um, emergency response free access etc cetera, etc cetera. and I love the that that kind of Megan's point keeps going back to what is really accessible and, and realistic um, for young learners and their families and then um, what kind of really helps keep the relationships um, kind of active and, and warm. Um, and so I think that there's, there can be, um, you know, an impulse to try lots of new technology tools. Obviously, from my perspective, that's something I'm really interested in and excited about. But, you know, just picking a few that really meet the instructional need, as, as everyone has mentioned in the past, um, and then kind of offer a really um, accessible entry point. Um, I think are the most important things. So even though there, there's a lot out there and it can be tempting to try a lot, it can also be immediately overwhelming and, and create new barriers that, you know, really are um, something to keep an eye out for. Mm -hmm. Now, Miriam, um, I wanted to, to turn to you um, and uh, ask, what, what are some examples uh, of asynchronous learning that you've seen work well? Well, just like Megan said, there are so many people that have been studying and writing about this. And we've been, many people in the College of Education have been doing this for a while. So there are so many, um, a few that come to mind right away. Uh, kind of at the base level that maybe a lot of people might think about uh, is content delivery. So certainly um, asynchronous Canvas in our case um, offers so much potential for, I like to think about it as curating, curating content. So we're not necessarily setting out to develop all our own new content. That's very time consuming and probably unrealistic, uh, for, especially right now in this time as we think about autumn. Um, but in general, it takes time to develop content. So um, this, this uh, concept is sometimes thought about as flipping the classroom in broader higher ed. And that's just simply asking our students to spend time ahead of a synchronous opportunity um, you know, understanding and grappling with content and coming ready to apply it in the synchronous opportunity. So if any, if nothing else, this, this kind of a hybrid asynchronous synchronous is, has many affordances for that model. And, there, and it's an evidence-based practice beyond the, the situation we're in now. So, um, and I, I heard some advice uh, session I was at at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, when you're thinking about, you know, what content would I wanna deliver? Uh, if you've taught the class a few times, think about what are those, what are those 
confusing concepts or those times where those common misconceptions and then really invest your time in creating succinct five minute kind of little um, ideally five minute, maybe 10, 10 minutes if you can't get it down to five minutes, chunks of content. And, and for the rest of it, see what you can just curate and pull, pull together. I think beyond content development, which you know, that has so many benefits allowing students to access, right? And it's an equity issue, watch, rewatch, rewatch, instead of just a lecture where I have to make sure I get the notes. And if I didn't get it, if I didn't retain it, I missed it. Um, but besides content delivery, you know, really thinking about Megan and Britta's point about relationship building. If we think about an online a canvas site, let's say as a virtual classroom, that is an environment, it's a virtual environment open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's always there. It's a space. If we think if we transform our thinking that it's not a, a collection of resources, it's actually a, a, an online environment. Um, there are many examples of ways to do that. And just a few, um, posting a lot of videos. So there's a lot, you can have a lot of teacher presence, what we call teacher presence or social presence in the online um, world, uh, where you can be very, very present and announcements or um, lots of videos along the way and, and text-based comments, lots of time. If you're, if you're not spending all your time lecturing or running class sessions, you can spend a lot more time giving individualized feedback or jumping into online discussion forums. And those informal spaces can be created. So in our program, I facilitate the curriculum and the faculty who teach in the online ECE program, the bachelor completion program. And we often have what we call study hall cafes or tech support forums. These are persistent discussions that students can hop in at any time. So if I'm confused about an assignment and it's 10 45 PM on a Saturday night and I'm a student, and I post, chances are there might be another student, especially if it's a larger class, at the same time, and they might hop in. Um, your instructor, if that's me, is not gonna be online and available at a, uh, that late at night on a Saturday, hopefully. <laughs> um, and so there are just so many ways to build those informal spaces online that actually offer more opportunities for that than if you only met at certain times. Um, and, and to further kind of sink into that, the affordances that Canvas offers with small groups. So in our program, we really, we really, really use this a lot. Students are placed in small groups um, at the beginning of each, every class that we teach and, and those groups persist and they're guided to really build community, get to know each other, develop norms, share. And in Canvas, they can actually have their own page. Canvas allows a page within the Canvas course. They can have, or if you use the Google Suite, I mean, whatever technology you wanna layer on for collaboration, um, those, those online discussions in groups, whether they're random or whether they're, they persist, uh, offer all the same affordances that Megan mentioned, I think, uh, earlier. Time to think, um, you know, access for our international and multilingual students to be able to communicate in written form rather than only um, oral communication. Uh, and, and, and on and on, many reasons. So if you think about, well, maybe I also wanna have some synchronous times, that's okay. You can think about, what about a hybrid approach? So what about one week, those groups are having rich online asynchronous discussions that might go across a week. So you might have three different due dates and they're hopping in and having really a back and forth exchange. And then next week we meet on a Zoom synchronous session. We do breakout rooms and those same groups get to come together. And then you have ensured an equity of voices in the online space. We all know what it's like to be in a group you know, whether you're the reticent one to speak or you're the one that likes to always have some, you have something to say all the time. <laughs> Sometimes, no matter how much we try to ensure otherwise, there are more dominant voices than others, right? In, in real, uh, real time interactions and online, you know, infusing asynchronous online can really help with that. So those are kind of a few examples <laughs> I can think of. <laughs> Sarah and Megan, uh, have, have you seen uh, some examples uh, that have worked uh, very well? Um, I'd add one, and I think it goes to both uh, the idea of building the relationships and, again, it, it yet still keeping the structure, I think, manageable. So we have a group of graduate students, and we had tended to use a lot of case studies, and we saved those for when we were in person. It was already a hybrid class, but that was a, a you know, real rich part of our time together. And, of course, now 
being asynchronous, we were really trying to figure out how to manage that. And so what we did is again, use the smaller groups. Um, the students actually already knew each other, which was a, a big, uh, I guess, jump for us, or, or it helped us really jump into this. But what we did is we were having the student leaders for each group meet weekly with one of the instructors to go over the case study briefly, um, just to kind of give them again a little bit of that, here's some things to watch for, here's some things you might want to focus on, and then we're leaving it to the leaders to find a time with that smaller group to meet over the course of the week, and then we're just asking them to give us just a quick, you know, sort of summary, how the discussion go, what'd you talk about. So it was a great way to not lose that interaction, um, to allow them to still keep those relationships with some of their uh, cohort members. And yet, again, by providing a little bit of structure, we kept it from being just really unwieldy in terms of trying to do it with everybody at once. And it still allowed a lot of flexibility in terms of scheduling. So, you know, I think that it's that rethinking what's important, where do we want the student energy going, and how do we manage that in a way that allows that to still happen. I so value these kinds of opportunities to learn from my colleagues, right? And I think that that's one of the, then for me, one of the most exciting things about kind of the, the current moment of crisis that we're in is of being, uh, having the opportunity to actually learn from colleagues who are doing this kind of work, who have been doing it for a long time in order to continuously kind of improve my own practice. And I think what Miriam brought up about this kind of instructor presence, um, even inside of um, my Canvas page that I use for my synchronous classes, I'm completely rethinking what what does my presence now look like inside of that space and how is it that um, when we've moved some classes to purely asynchronous that I can still build these relationships with um, students and a, a key kind of takeaway for me that I've been using that I've gotten such productive feedback from my students is around um, taking video of myself, talking with them, talking through the assignment that I want them to do. And I stumble over my words. I don't try to make it a really polished video. Like I, I know if we were all standing and sitting in the same room together, I'd still stumble over my words and I, I, I get lost in my thoughts. Right. So, so it's a, it's a way I feel like of, of, for them to still be able to see me. And I've actually started to encourage them in our weekly discussion posts that I'm asking them to, to do their own videos. And again, this is a way that some students have, have said, oh, that's, I really appreciate that. Like, I think some students really, really want the opportunity to think about and write out their responses. But for some, the opportunity for them to talk about their ideas feels uh, especially productive. So I give them the option of, completing a discussion post either with a video and I give them very clear ex expectations around how long that video should be right or or through writing and a very clear explanation of how long that writing should be um, and then when they're responding to each others they can also again use a video or or written text and I feel like that's just opened up the interactions that they're starting to have between each other um, in multiple ways for people to have that autonomy, for learners to have that autonomy over how they participate, they have to post and they have to post to two peers. But when they have choices about how they do that posting, um, it seems to really engage them in some productive ways that, that were definitely surprising to me. And I don't think I would have been pushed to think about that if I hadn't had um, the real encouragement and support from colleagues who have been trying this for so much longer than we have. Alberta, I wanted to turn to um, what uh, what your thoughts are about what are some things that educators should be careful to avoid um, in an asynchronous learning environment? Yeah, I mean, I think we've touched on these uh, indirectly, so I'll be kind of building on points that other people have already made, I think. Um, but one kind of major one is um, around this idea that asynchronous is inherently self-paced. And and that really is, you know, that's the case to a, a certain point, but really um, a, a strong asynchronous learning environment does rely on the presence that we've been touching on a few times now. And so even though, you know, activities and um, 
engaging with content from the student perspective can be completed flexibly on a somewhat flexible timeline um, that students really still need the, the prompt feedback um, and guidance and having their questions answered and their ideas challenged and extended um, that you would have in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, and so even things like you know, instructional adjustments. The, 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 the instructor's role is still a very active one and is still kind of um, providing lots of different touch points, again, to build relationships. So the, the sort of self-paced nature is maybe from a day-to-day -day kind of idea, but certainly not over the course of the course, I guess, is one way to think of it. Um, so that's one thing to, you know, be really conscious about and in planning and facilitation. Um, and then I think this is actually a, a point Sarah made too, is that smaller chunks of information and content really work so much better, um, especially in an asynchronous environment. And so uh, I love Sarah's idea about kind of even within these maybe like week level modules or lessons, having sort of smaller goals um, to kind of help guide students to work through them, again, flexibly, but in a way that kind of gives them the highest chance of success and, and helps them not to feel overwhelmed or alone or isolated, some of the concerns that some people um, might have. Um, and then also, there is just the point that like, watching something from your home on your own is going to be a slightly different experience than, you know, sitting um, and listening to a really engaging person lecture for 40 minutes, say, right? That same engagement that you might feel in person is probably not going to be there, even with a really, you know, um, charismatic, dynamic presenter. And so, you know, 10, 15 minute kinds of content delivery chunks that allow a person to think about something, do something, and then maybe return to hear more about the topic. Um, that's something to, to shoot for rather than kind of having a longer um, kind of chunk of, of content delivered. Uh, Miriam, do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Any, any uh, pitfalls uh, to avoid? Yeah, you know, the thing I was just thinking about as you were talking and I was sort of also in this experience really enjoying this conversation with you all is that you shouldn't try to teach alone, uh, online alone, or, or for, especially for the first time. Don't try to do it by yourself. <laughs> it is, it, it's, it's learning a new skill, right? I don't know how many of us actually have experienced, especially asynchronous, high quality, deeply engaging online learning community like we're talking about right now. You know, I hadn't really experienced that much before I started trying to create them. <laughs> and so when we don't have a lot to draw on, um, from our own experiences, or even if we do, even if we've had a really wonderful experience, um, you know, here in, in the College of Education and in, you know, anyone listening at other se settings, um, I would just really, really, you know, encourage folks to find a community, um, others who are doing the same thing, maybe others that have tried, you know, and that had some successes are also learning and and Britta and her team are just fabulous. And, you know, I couldn't have done what I did without working with an instructional designer in the beginning to really help me. Um, so just don't try to do it all alone and have a lot of grace. I guess another mistake is, you know, trying to do too much right away, right? Be realistic. <laughs> uh, Sarah and Megan, any, any thoughts about other uh, pitfalls uh, uh, educators should try to avoid? I'll just echo, don't, don't think that it has to be a polished professional uh, performance. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of us are very comfortable in front of a class. I am much less uncomfortable in front of the camera. I think my first time I tried to record something, I, I probably did it 15 times. You know, I kept deleting it, starting over and thinking I had to just nail it. But we don't do that in our classroom. And I think that it does allow us to show our personality when we're just there. And I think the, the passion that we have about the content, the care that we have about sharing something with the students, that's going to come through. And that's probably going to help soften the other rough edges around uh, how we deliver it. So I think those are great, great points. I think that, I think it's been mentioned, right? But I think that recognizing that 
especially if you're trying to do this really quickly, given our current context, or even if you're taking time, like this is a different kind of learning experience for learners, right? So being really transparent about that, trying to, not trying to pretend like it's going to be exactly like if we were all sitting in the same room together, right? So, so naming that kind of checking in around that, I feel like if we just assume that it's going to be exactly the same or that, um, the things we have been able to historically do by walking into a classroom with a group of learners in person, oh, that won't be that easy. That won't be that hard to, to kind of switch it over. Like it's a, it's, a learn, it's a learning curve for everyone, for us as the instructor and for the, the students to be engaging in it. And so um, I feel like to, to, to recognize that, to name that, if we try to pretend like it's just going to be exactly the same, I feel like that's a pitfall that we could fall into and, and, and feel really frustrated or overwhelmed from whatever, whatever side we might be on around that. But, but the more transparent we can be around it, the clearer we can all be about trying to, to get feedback on it too, right? I feel like that is something, it feels to me especially important inside of an asynchronous space to be asking for more feedback from students about how things are working, how things are going. I can't just assume because you're turning things in that everything, that this learning environment is working really well for you, right? I don't have the same kind of cues of having body language to check and to look and see and, and, and check in on a break, great, right? Or things like that if we are all in person or synchronous together. So where are there opportunities for me to not overwhelm by surveys or, or feedback or exit cards or things like that, but, but where am I getting in some ways more, more regular feedback from how things are working and what what are the needs that students have um, feels like something that, that is key to kind of, to highlight, you know. Mm -hmm. So then uh, to, to sort of close our conversation here, um, Sarah, uh, I was wondering if, if you could maybe share um, uh, some ways that, that you've expanded your use of, of asynchronous learning uh, in, in this time of COVID and, and, and why uh, you've been doing that. I have to laugh at your question about why, because I admit I would not be doing it if it wasn't for COVID. So the why is, is that we have to. And again, I, I think that, especially as I've talked with some of my colleagues here, the good news is that they're all, um, they're all taking that approach of, we're gonna just make this work and, and do the best we can and try to share what we're learning. So, so that, that's really, that is the why. But I think the ways that, um, maybe to take a twist on that, the ways that I've expanded the use are to really go back and try to figure out where do we, where do I want the student energy to go? Like what part of the activity, what part of the class do I want them to focus on? And then how do I try to maximize that? Um, so for example, I, I'm teaching one class where we, I've used a lot of video in the past, but I love that idea, Mary, you, you used in terms of saying that we're curators. So now when I give the video, I assume there's some, uh, there's going to be some just interest because video is probably more interesting than hearing me lecture, but I've also tried to introduce it in a way to, to get them to focus where I want them to focus. So to provide some guiding questions about it, to do a short intro to say why I'm asking them to watch it. And in that way, I think I am taking that role of a curator you know, sort of more seriously. And I probably didn't do that even with the synchronous class, which again is gonna be a carryover, uh, maybe a learning for me. Um, also the idea of just m multiple options. I, I tend, I think to, to think, here's the way, again, give me the paper. And I probably still haven't quite gotten far enough in that, but really thinking about not only multiple options of delivery for the student, but again, how do I maximize that flexibility for them for a lot of reasons, that reason around equity that we talked about of what resources do they have, but also just those different learning styles and those different ways that students best can communicate their ideas. And so I think that that's one of those, again, maybe a residual effect of all of this will be to, to be more expansive in how we approach our synchronous learning when it's not what we have to do, but we might choose to do it in that way. So those are a few things I think that will probably change, you know, my teaching and from, it sounds like all of our teaching in the long run, but uh, I guess the silver lining in all of this in some ways. 
Uh, Megan, uh, what, what are your thoughts about uh, expanding uh, your use of bank synchronous learning uh, now and, and maybe uh, going into the future? Absolutely. I mean, I think that we've run a program that's supporting teachers across Washington State to earn their certification while they're working full time. And we've always done things synchronously because myself as a teacher educator and all of the teacher educators that work in our program, we all were classroom teachers at some point. And so we've felt like, well, of course we need to be synchronous together. That's how you learn. You learn in community. And, and the only way we could think about that was to learn in community in a synchronous way. And we've operated as a program since 2011. And every single year, our students who are teachers full time are overwhelmed and exhausted. And so they come weekly to our synchronous class sessions and it's been a rejuvenating space, but then they're still exhausted and overwhelmed, right? And, and I think that um, I kind of made a programmatic decision in this time of COVID, we were gonna move to more asynchronous. And none of my instructors really pushed back because they were like, yeah, oh yeah, I've got my kids home now too. I've got this going on. Like there's a whole lot more to be thinking about. And a week or two in, they all said, this makes a whole lot more sense. Why aren't we doing this, period? <laughs> like we were forced to do it because of this current moment. But there's something about it, like what Sarah, I think, is saying that is really making us wonder about what does this look like past this moment in time and past this moment in history? And at least for us as a program that is supporting people who are also working full time, that, that this, that, that the flexibility and the, what we see as more equitable opportunities through asynchronous learning environments seems to really feel really promising to us that, that I think we, I knew we'd heard it before, but we were still like, it's a lot of work. Like, do we really need to do that? <laughs> you know? And so, so finding, finding ourselves being pressed to do it is we're seeing the power of it and the hearing from our students themselves about how they appreciate it in this moment, but actually it would be really helpful at any moment in their learning as a teacher. And so, um, so I'm, I'm hopeful about how this has grown our own practice. It is a silver lining and it's making a shift the way that we're thinking about our work in some really um, productive ways. And I'm, I'm curious to see as we return to normal and, or this is our new normal. And, and it's pushing us to also think about how do we not only in the College of Education think about supporting asynchronous learning, but how do we support all of the educators who are out there in the world to think about productive ways of learning remotely and to think about all of the kind of pieces of what does that look like to curate, like my colleagues are saying, the very different kinds of resources that are available for P12 teachers to be using and interacting with families and for P12 teachers to hone their practice and think about all of this, that, that it is a moment where we could all be um, making sense of this together and potentially really shifting the future of what teaching and learning can look like um, in some ways that feel simultaneously terrifying and also really exciting <laughs> to be thinking about. <laughs> this is just kind of tilting everything a little bit. I wanted to jump back in just because I completely agree and with what I said and what Megan said. However, I think it is a silver lining and there are some storm clouds. So, so let's, I want to make sure we acknowledge that there is something that I think is so valuable and so um, helpful in being with people physically in, in the same space. And so while we have to do this, and while I do think there is going to be this residual effect that will improve that time together, I guess I want to be careful that people don't think, oh, so the answer is it's all online and it's all asynchronous. And so I, and so I, just, I just want to say that because I, otherwise I would feel, I think, remiss because I don't think any, I don't think any of us really believe that this is the new answer to everything. Um, but it does give us a way to rethink even that time together and how to expand so that those times are used really carefully and in a, in a um, efficient way and in an equitable way. But I will be really happy to also step into a classroom and have the students right there and watch them 
react or nod or engage in material in person. So I just, I just want us to not sort of give the wrong impression because I don't think any of us were arguing for let's go all, all asynchronous or all online. So. Uh, Miriam and Britta, uh, any closing thoughts uh, about uh, the future of, of asynchronous learning or, or about finding that balance between asynchronous learning and, and actual in-person learning? Yeah, I would just say, I would go back to kind of the, the earlier conversation we had about what are the purposes? What are our intents? Where do we want? What are our outcomes? And that's going to look really different in different classes with different groups of learners. Um, and, and some classes might be appropriate to be asynchronous and other classes would absolutely not be appropriate to be asynchronous long term, right? And a hybrid model might be really great for a lot of classes for a lot of reasons. Um, and so I think the more we, we sometimes, we haven't been able to have those conversations in great depth because we haven't understood the capabilities of asynchronous. It just, ha it's been outside of our grasp or it, it is time consuming, right? There are some barriers that have existed and I hope over time that we reduce some of those barriers that we have, we understand more about some of the affordances of asynchronous so that we can intentionally use it when it's appropriate and, and with groups of learners when it's appropriate and that you know, we think about our experience this last quarter and maybe planning for autumn. That's um, one, one model of going online at a rapid pace and being forced to, and that's not really um, what online teaching fully is, right? Whether synchronous or asynchronous. And so I hope all of us, when we've had a taste, we realize, wow, we, we get a taste for what asynchronous could be, and now let's explore how to do that well, thoughtfully, um, for the future in ways that make sense. Yeah, I would just echo that, and, and I hear you, Sarah, about kind of just the, the idea that this isn't a long-term replacement, and it, it isn't something um, an end-all, be-all by any means. I think it's a, you know, an understanding of how to set up and, and manage and facilitate a great asynchronous learning experience is one tool of, of many and, and helping all of our students learn. So I think it is a tool that will be important as we navigate some kind of uncertain settings um, over the next little while. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that is exciting to think about learning about and employing in your own context. Well, uh, Britta, Miriam, uh, Megan, and Sarah, thank you so much uh, for your time here today uh, and uh, sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin.